Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, we talk about withdrawal rates, risks, and returns in retirement. We start by talking through some of the more traditional financial planning approaches and get into some of the investment strategies we run through our capital management firm for investors and the tools we utilize when working with individuals and thinking about withdrawal strategies off of a portfolio. With stock valuations high and bond yields low, the traditional 4% withdrawal rate on a diversified portfolio may have to be lower in the future or investors may have to make other adjustments. Jack and I tackle this topic, which can be complex and unique to each investor, given their income, portfolio, expenses, time horizon, and more. But this is an important topic for many investors nearing or in retirement. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion. Okay, Jack, today you and I are going to talk about some of the things that uh, we've been doing more of here as a firm around um, retirement planning, working with clients that are sort of nearing or in retirement. A lot of people that listen to us um, probably know by now that we, you know, run actual investment strategies for investors. Um, Sometimes our clients are just looking for us to manage, you know, a sleeve of their equity investments uh, because they're attracted to the way that we sort of look at things and and the portfolios we run and and our investment philosophy and our strategies. But um, in many other cases, you know, we are dealing with investors that are, in retirement or nearing retirement. And, you know, what we need to be thinking about with those investors is um, withdrawal rates and sequence risk and how to properly allocate between stocks, bonds, and other asset classes, um, different investment strategies that are suitable for them. So this is some of the stuff I think we're going to kind of talk about today. And and you wrote um, an article a few weeks ago on sort of um, the the importance of looking at uh, withdrawal rates, market declines, um, the 4% rule, which we'll sort of talk about in a minute, um, and all that stuff that sort of, you know, investors need to be be thinking about. And I think, you know, given the market today, given what we're seeing in the market with some of these declines, you know, I think it brings some of this maybe more front and center for investors than it it might've been otherwise. So, I mean, maybe with that, I'll let you kind of get into some of the main points or one of the main points in the article, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, you know, this is probably one of the most important things for a lot of investors because, you know, many investors we work with, but many investors in general are are in retirement. And so the idea as you sort of get to where you're going to be in retirement is you, you have to figure out how much money can I spend? And, you know, there's a lot of complicated ways you can do that, but, you know, in, investors don't want to hear all the complicated ways. I mean, you basically want a simple rule to say, all right, you know, I can start spending this amount of money. Maybe I can adjust it for inflation in the future, but give me a simple idea in terms of how much money I can spend. And so that, that's sort of where the 4% rule came from. You know, there was a bunch of research that said, you know, if you spend 4% or less of your portfolio, the odds of you not running out of money eventually are, are pretty high, you know, based on, you know, based on looking at the market and what's going on historically, you have a pretty good chance of not running out of money, you know, actually a very high chance of not running out of money, at least historically, if you spend 4% of your portfolio. And so that, that's so, so advi- many advisors use that rule. They basically came up, you know, took, took that simple rule and have put it into practice for clients. And, you know, it's, it's an easy way for clients to figure out what they need to spend. But, you know, we're quants. And so when, when we looked at this, we, we wanted to look at this in, in a bunch of different directions. And we, we wanted to look at sort of building portfolios for people and, you know, how you do that in such a way to try to optimize their ability to spend, you know, as much as they possibly can in retirement. And that, that was basically the basis for my article as I was looking at the idea that a huge part of that equation is how much the drawdown is of your portfolio. And so, you know, a lot of people sort of think about like, if if I want to build a portfolio for retirement and I want to be able to take 4% of my money out, well, maybe the best way to do that is just to invest my money in stocks. Because if you think about it, stocks produce what, you know, eight, 10% a year. If I'm investing in something that produces eight, 10% a year, I mean, it it seems to make sense that I should easily be able to take 4% out and and not have a problem. But where you run into a problem with that is, is the, the whole concept of risk and the whole concept of drawdowns, which is, Yes, stocks do percent, you know, produce eight to ten percent a year, but they do it in a very rocky way. They they don't do it consistently. 
And so when you produce those returns inconsistently, you can have, if you get the worst case scenario or if you get the negative scenario, you can end up with a situation where you can't withdraw you know, as much money as you, as you wanted to. So that was sort of the idea is, is we were gonna just look at some different portfolios and, and look at this concept of withdrawal rates and, and think about how withdrawal rates and sort of the drawdowns of your portfolio play with each other. Yeah, so one of the ways that you can kind of get at this is you can do something called a Monte Carlo simulation. And um, we actually utilize a tool called eMoney. And what eMoney allows you to do is input all of your investments along with your cash flows and your expenses. And by running what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, it's able to take your portfolio and your allocation and the historical uh, risk and return statistics on those things along with the income and expenses and, and run this you know very complicated simulation that looks over a thousand different um, scenarios to determine how likely is it the investor is going to you know either outlive their money or run out of money um, if I'm saying that correctly and so you know that's something that a lot of financial planners do um, we do it here for some of our clients. So a lot of times when we're working with a client, um, they're not only coming into e-money, but we're also, um, uh, you know, discussing things. And now that Jack has that uh, credential, um, you know, we're sort of, sort of, that's more of what we're doing um, as a firm. But Jack, you want to add anything to that with the Monte Carlo stuff? No, yeah. The general idea of Monte Carlo is pretty simple, which is, you know, we have these, we have all these historical returns the market's produced. Well, what if we take all those historical returns and what if we reorder them in like a, a, as many possible combinations as we can? And, and then we look at someone's retirement path under all of those different scenarios. So we have a scenario where the returns are really good at the beginning. We have a scenario where the returns are average. You know, we have a scenario where the returns are awful at the beginning. If we look at all of those scenarios and then say, for this person's particular situation, in what percentage of those scenarios did they run out of money? Were they not able to support themselves through their retirement? And so that's how Monte Carlo can be very useful. Going back to what I talked about before with the example of stocks you know, being used to meet the 4% rule, the reason that stocks sometimes don't meet withdrawal rates is that, is that you just get really, really unlucky. You, you retire at the exact wrong time. You have that major drawdown at the beginning. And that's what Monte Carlo can sort of, you know, it's not a perfect thing, but it can sort of help you do. It can, it can help you say, all right, you know, in 88% in of the simulations, you, you were fine, but in 12% of the simulations, you ran out of money. You know, can you live with that level of risk? And, and that's sort of something that's, in, you know, specific to each individual, but each person sort of has to get comfortable around because you're not gonna, you know, typically in these Monte Carlos, a lot of the time you're not gonna get to 100% of the time it worked out for you. So it's, it's something you have to work with each investor to try to figure out, you know, what, what are you comfortable with? And I think a lot of planners tend to use like around 90% or something like that, but you know, what are you comfortable with in terms of the chance this won't work out? But it also, it just puts it in perspective for people to say, all right, you know, here are the odds based on history, which doesn't always play out that way. Here are the odds you have that bad scenario. Here's the odds you have that good scenario and sort of balancing those against each other. Yeah. And one of the worst case scenarios is, you know, if you, let's say you retire, let's just use somebody that has a million dollar portfolio. They retire um, in January of 2022. And then, you know, starting in February of 2022, we go into a real bad bear market and they have a significant amount of stocks in their portfolio. Well, if they take a 40% hit on the equity portfolio or on their stock investments, and then, you know, they're taking withdrawals off of that money to live off of, you're effectively like locking in those losses and you're taking money out of the portfolio when it's down, which is not a good time to do it. So that's, that's the concept of sequence risk. And one of the things, Jack, we've been talking more about is, you know, maybe this idea of having, it's almost like you want to have less risk um, to minimize that sequence risk early in retirement. And then as you go further in retirement, you can actually up the risk, which is completely opposite of, I think, the way a lot of people think about investing, they sort of use, you know, you should take your age, you know, minus, minus by 100. And that's, you know, the percentage of stocks you should have in the portfolio. But, you know, maybe this idea of sequence risk, especially early on in retirement, it kind of flips that around a little bit um, in the event that you get a really bad market environment, you know, early in retirement. Yeah. So the, the best way to think about sequence risk is, so let's say I give you the 30 returns for the stock market, or, you know, 30 individual annual returns for the stock market. 
if, if I'm not putting money into my portfolio and I'm not withdrawing money, if I'm just leaving it there, it is irrelevant how the order of those 30 returns. The worst years can come at the beginning. The worst years can come at the end. It doesn't matter. It, it makes no difference. So, But as soon as I start withdrawing money, if, if those bad years come at the beginning, it's a huge risk to me. And the reason is because I'm withdrawing money while the market is down. And so that money cannot compound back up when the market goes back up. And so, and it, by the way, it's, op, it's the opposite when you're young. And, you know, a lot of times people will say to young investors, you know, you want a bear market as soon as you start investing, which can be, you know, terrible. Like if you, if you just start investing the first year you put your money in and then you lose half that money, it can be terrible, but that's exactly what you want. Because when you're adding money, sequence risk works in reverse. You want the worst years at the beginning because you get them out of the way and then you're, you know, you're continuing to add money and you're compounding. So, but in, in retirement, that, that's the idea is basically that your riskiest years end up being those years around when you retire, not maybe towards the end. And so it's really important to manage drawdowns in that period. And, and th that's where, where the article came from is sort of thinking about what combinations of different asset classes and, and different things can you do to manage that risk early and to try to manage those drawdowns to, to give you a better chance of achieving whatever your withdrawal rate is. Yeah, you, and you had a chart in the article, and we'll, I'll actually put this in the YouTube because I think it's important, but you showed 100% allocation to stocks, an allocation to stocks and bonds, and then an allocation to stocks, bonds, and gold. And what you were trying to get at is, you know, what withdrawal rate could you um, have a 90% confidence in, um, given that type of allocation? And then you showed, um, you know, the max drawdown and then the max drawdown with uh, cash flow. So I'll, um, maybe I'll let you just speak to it because I think you can probably describe it pretty well. Yeah. So this is a simple way to look at that concept. So we talked about the 4% rule and, you know, so when I looked at this, um, you know, and tried to develop like a 90% confidence, you know, confident rate you could withdraw from your portfolio, I got about 4% with hundred percent stocks. So that means about 90% of the time you were okay, at least historically. Now we'll talk later about where we are now, but at least historically, you know, you could meet a 4% withdrawal rate with hundred percent stocks about 90% of the time you had a maximum drawdown with hundred percent stocks of 58%. And, you know, your maximum drawdown with cash flow, which is sort of the third column, which is basically going back to the concept of I'm withdrawing money from my account. So if, if, I, lose, if I go to zero, if I run out of money, my maximum drawdown with cash flow actually becomes 100%. And so in this case, your maximum drawdown in cash flow was with cash flow was 100% because I only met my withdrawal rate 90% of the time. So in the years that I didn't, I got a maximum, you know, in the situations or the simulations where I didn't, I got a maximum withdrawal rate of 100%. You know, I lost all my money basically. Um, so then when you, when you mix stocks with bonds, obviously your return goes down, but that 90% confident withdrawal rate, that withdrawal rate you can, you can make 90% of the time goes up to 5.6%, at least historically. And so that shows you the idea of blending in these uncorrelated asset classes and managing sequence risk. The reason this is going up is because I'm not having those major drawdowns anymore. I'm limiting those drawdowns. And so I'm limiting the risk that right at the beginning of my retirement, I'm going to have this massive drawdown and I'm not going to be able to make up for it. And so the stock and bond portfolio had a max drawdown of 26% and a max drawdown with cash flow of only 34%, which basically means, you know, I never ran out of money. Um, I, I was able to, you know, I, I never ran out of money in, in that scenario. Um, and then the final thing I did is just, this is, and you know, we don't necessarily advocate this, but just to give you an idea of it, like we, we mix stocks, bonds, and gold. Um, and so when you mix stocks, bonds, and gold, your withdrawal rate went up even a little bit more, even though your return again went down. But the, the reason being you're, you're again in introducing an uncorrelated asset class at a small percentage to the portfolio. And so, so by doing that, you're able to sustain a little bit higher withdrawal rate. The sequence risk is a little bit less of an issue. And so the overall concept here though is really return is not the only thing when you're trying to, you know, when you're trying to meet a certain withdrawal rate, drawdowns can be a very important thing. And so and we kind of see that by mixing in these various different asset classes, we see that we're able to have a higher confidence in maintaining a higher withdrawal rate, even though I'm adding in asset classes, the stocks that have worse performance. And, and that's the general concept. So one of the things that we do do here as a firm is, um, and really to just add on to what you're saying and how we kind of take this idea and actually develop an investment strategy around it. Um, we have a strategy that actually combines three of our different risk managed models into one, and we call that permanent protective momentum. So it uses aspects of the permanent portfolio, aspects of generalized protective momentum and protective asset allocation, which are all different investment strategies that blend a number of different assets together to try to produce a lower risk 
type of approach. And when we are working with clients and someone is in retirement or nearing retirement, you know, strategies like that come into play for us. Um, we're sort of, at least at this point, um, we're a little bit anti the traditional um, 60 40 stock bond allocation. Although, with that being said, you know, it still could be great for some people. Um, we just tend to look at things uh, a little differently than that right now, given uh, where things are in the market, which maybe we'll talk about in a minute. But um, that's kind of how we do it in the real world for actual clients. It's, you know, taking these risk managed strategies, blending them together. And really, what we're trying to get at is managing managing the drawdowns, managing the sequence risk, and making sure the client is set up for success. Because the last thing you want to do, by the way, as well, is you don't want to be um, selling you know, in a big market decline. You don't want to be like almost reducing risk then because probably part of the losses or most of the losses are going to be past you at that point. Yeah, so the idea with this, this portfolio is, you know, we were trying, we try to tackle everything as people who listen to us know, we try to tackle everything quantitatively and based on evidence. And so the idea was, all right, if, if we want to build a, a portfolio that's lower risk, you know, given what's going on with stocks and bonds and expected returns being low there, we want to try to incorporate some other asset classes into it. How do we build something where with the idea of limiting drawdowns as much as possible? And obviously when you, when you limit drawdowns, I mean, you're not going to get the return on something like this that you're going to get on equities over the long term. You know, that, but that's not the goal. The goal is if, if we know that limiting drawdowns allows, you know, clients that we're managing money for to have higher withdrawal rates, we, we want to try to do that in whatever way we can. And, and so the idea behind this portfolio, and we've talked about it in other videos, but the idea is, so let's use momentum to build a diversified portfolio between stocks, bonds, commodities, gold, all these asset classes. And, and we'll try to be in the asset classes, you know, to have the biggest weight to the asset classes that have the most momentum. And then also these, you know, these portfolios, which again, we've talked about in another video, they have this drawdown, this uh, component where basically they can raise cash substantially when like all the asset classes tend to be falling simultaneously. And so that the idea was trying to build something quantitatively that allows us to manage this problem we've, you know, we, we've come up with here. And, and obviously it's not a perfect solution. Like anything else, it's going to have its periods where it works and its periods it doesn't. But it, it had a, you know, it, it was the best we could do in terms of managing that max drawdown, which allows for the highest withdrawal rate and also allows us to deal with this idea going forward that for people who are reducing risk in their portfolios, and we've kind of seen that this year, bonds and stocks, we may in an inflationary environment have stock, a period where stocks and bonds go down together. And so that risk reducing component of bonds, although it'll still be there because bonds will go down less than stocks, the idea that bonds are going up when stocks are going down, that may not be present. And so this is sort of using momentum to try to deal with that and try to build like a multi-asset class portfolio to solve the problem we've talked about, which is, you know, trying to get the highest withdrawal rate you possibly can. And there's some sort of non-investment strategy, I think, methods that investors should also be thinking about um, when thinking about these withdrawal rates. And that includes, you know, maybe um, adjusting your uh, withdrawals um, and altering your spending behavior. I think having different or maybe more realistic or lower return assumptions. If you're close to retirement, but still saving, maybe upping your savings rate is a strategy um, to try to get your portfolio bigger. So that when you do enter retirement, you have um, more money to work for you. And there's also this concept, I, Jack, you didn't mention this in the article, um, this rebalancing effect, which, you know, investors might be able to help their returns. It's, it's, it's difficult, but investors might be able to help their returns by rebalancing into things after um, large declines. And I think like March of 2020 would have been a good example if you had, you know, a stock and bond portfolio when stocks went way down while well, your bonds actually went up. Um, investors that actually made moves and brought their allocation back to a target allocation after a decline like that, you know, you can actually help improve your returns over time. So those are just some, you know, other strategies. I know you wanted to kind of talk about variable withdrawal strategies a little bit more, but those are some other things investors can think about. Um, when thinking about this. Yeah, you know, we talked about sort of handling this problem on the investment side. So trying to, you know, handle this sequence risk problem on the investment side, but there is a, there are other ways to handle it. You know, it's typically not as ideal for clients, but the other idea is to handle it on the withdrawal side. So if I'm willing to reduce my withdrawals when I have a major downturn in the market, you know, th then the sequence risk becomes less of an issue. Um, you know, that can be problematic for people because they get used to living on a certain amount of money and they don't want to, you know, when the economy's bad and when everything's going wrong, they don't want to reduce that money. 
but there, there's some ways you can do that, you know, without, without doing it completely. So, you know, you have, you have sort of a spectrum of ideas here. On one hand, you have, I'm going to take my 4% no matter what. On the other hand, you know, and that, that 4%, by the way, is based on the initial value of your portfolio. It doesn't alter when your portfolio alters, I mean, when the value of your portfolio changes. On the other end, you've got sort of a full variable withdrawal strategy, which means I'm going to take 4% of whatever I have. So if my portfolio gets cut in half, I'm going to only take 4% of that half. And, and that's, that obviously leads to a much higher you know, chance of, of reaching your goals, but people just can't do that in the real world. You can't just say, all right, I'm going to reduce my spending by half. So then you have these sort of guardrail type systems that say, all right, if, if it gets you know, to an extreme where, where my withdrawal rate rises a lot because my portfolio goes down, well, I'm going to kind of meet in the middle. You know, I'll, I'll reduce my withdrawal rate some, and that'll help a lot with sequence risk because at least I'm not taking the full amount during the drawdowns. And, you know, and it works the same way too. If my portfolio goes up a lot and my withdrawal rate gets too low, well, then I can take some extra money. And so these guardrail strategies sort of give you a way to adjust your spending somewhat, but not, not to the level of reducing it completely, like where you have a 50% drawdown in the market and you're reducing your spending by 50%. So the idea is you can, you can tackle this. You can tackle this. People like us can tackle this on the investment side and say, all right, let's try to have a, build a portfolio that has the lowest drawdowns we possibly can. But you also can tackle it on the spending side um, by saying, I'm willing to adjust my spending during bad periods to limit the effect of this. And one of the things that investors are facing today, and I'm you know, I'm going back to my comment on the 60-40. Um, you know, if you look at expected future returns and equities, it, you know, most projections have them coming in lower than their historical average. And you also have extremely low bond yields by all intents and purposes based on historical rates. And, you know, we're now seeing higher levels of inflation. So those two factors, um, you know, you could make a very good case that the net, the returns for the next 10 years on something like the 6040, you know, is going to be lower than the historical average, just given where valuations are and given where rates are today. And actually, Barron's had um, a really interesting article. It was the title of the article was forget the 4% rule, why re retirees need to rethink about their withdrawal strategy. This was from December, actually. So this whole article was a cover article cover cover article i believe was about this concept and the one um they had all this data in there that, that they take from morningstar and one of the things that um they showed was that um to this four percent rule thing that if you look at where valuations are today today in stocks and the bond yields they ran a, a portfolio that had 50 percent stocks 40 percent bonds and 10 percent cash and the new safe withdrawal rate wasn't four percent it was 3.3 percent so that is effectively an eight, eight it was you know it's an 18 percent decline from where you maybe safely you know a couple of years ago or maybe 10 years ago you could have withdrawn four percent you know now they're saying there's you know you can only withdraw 3.3 percent of that money each year without you know running out of um with running out of money so that's an interesting article if people want to want to take a look at that um and that gets to the point of, you know, when we had Wade Fowle on the podcast, he sort of talked about this as well. You know, this idea that, you know, you can think like in a normal market time, you can run these simulations and say, you know, in a normal market valuation, what are my chances of meeting a 4% withdrawal rate? And then there's another way you can look at it, which is to say, in a very expensive market coupled with low bond yields, what are my chances of meeting a 4% withdrawal rate? And unfortunately, the answer to the second question is a lot lower. And so th that, again, going back to that portfolio we've developed, that's another thing we're trying to tackle. And, you know, whether that'll be successful or not, you know, we'll see. But the idea is for investors who are retiring now with high valuations and low bond yields, you have to think more about is 4% really realistic, you know, given the expected returns in the future. And given also, you know, when you do have high valuations, you know, valuations don't tell us anything about where the market's going in the next one year, the next three years, but you do tend to have higher risk. So in, if, if that leads to higher vari variability of returns, it gets back to what we talked about before, which is you may have a higher chance of one of these drawdowns where sequence risk becomes a problem for you. So, you know, there's no great answer to this, but I think for anybody who's retiring now, you have to at least think about, you know, can I live on a withdrawal rate less than 4%? Because the odds, you know, I talked before about the odds historically of 4% working might be like 90% or something. They're probably lower than that now because expected returns are lower both on the stock side and the bond side. And that's where most people have their money invested. So we've talked about a lot today. This is an important topic for a lot of investors. It's a complicated topic. There's a lot of moving pieces 
and variables, the investment side, the behavioral side, the expense side, future returns. Um, but hopefully this conversation, you know, is helpful, is valuable to you, and it gets you thinking about things um, in your investment strategy if you're in retirement or nearing retirement. And um, hopefully this has been helpful. So thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.